I know that there are probably some of you who are here today, not because you want to learn more about Jesus, but like, for instance, your mom said, yes, we're having ham for those who come to church. Well, here you are. We're glad you're here. I'm glad for your mom. I'm glad she has that spirit. Or maybe you brought your three-year-old daughter and she has a beautiful new dress on and you thought, yes, we could go to Valentino's buffet, but it's going to get destroyed there. Let's go to church. And I'm glad you brought her. She is, del- she's just, she's, she is just, she's beautiful. But we're also glad you're here too. Or maybe your brother and sister-in-law are in town and they're churchgoers and they wanted to come to church. You said, well, I'm going to take you to Third City. So we're glad you're here too. There might be other reasons. I don't know. Whatever brought you here, whether you're joining us right here in this room, over in the plaza, you know, in Broken Bow, online, whatever, we are, we are excited that you're here. And <clears throat> by the way, tomorrow when you go to work, someone might ask you, what did you do over the weekend? And here's what I would suggest you do. You just you like squint and like, like fix your hair and, uh, and, and, and whisper and say, why, what did you hear? <laughs> and then just say, I went to church, what'd you do? You know, I mean, just have some fun. We've been walking through the Gospel of Mark as a church and we're, we're, we're about three months into this journey we're on. And uh, the book of Mark is in the New Testament of your Bible. It's one of the four Gospels. Uh, And we have, just in the last few weeks, seen some remarkable things happen. Uh, We saw in chapter 4 that Jesus calmed a stormy sea, that he freed a man from demonic oppression. And today, we're going to take the calendar back to another day that was really remarkable. And it really fits the theme of this day, the theme of resurrection. So beginning with uh, chapter 5, verse 21, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, so he's been ping-ponging back and forth, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. So this crowd has gathered again that was probably there before. They were waiting for him to come back. And this boat has been somewhere. I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, they started out right here in this town called Capernaum. And he had taught thousands of people from the boat. And then they went to the other side of the lake. But in the meantime, while they're in the middle of it, a storm rose up and it threatened the lives of those on the boat. He was actually in an armada of boats. And so in this very impossible moment, Jesus just stood up and stilled it. Just shh, shh, and it stopped. And then they continued on to the Gentile side of the lake. They were on the Jewish side of the lake. And so they stopped there, and he's promptly accosted by a naked, raging, bloody Gentile in a cemetery. A real nightmare. Real nightmare. The man was under con- the control of demonic forces. Many demons, the scripture says. So this would be a man who everyone in his village, everyone in his family would have said, you go live somewhere else because you're impossible. And so that's where he was. Jesus cast the demons into a herd of 2,000 pigs that had lost their minds and then committed suicide by jumping off a cliff. I just couldn't, I've been holding that one out for like two weeks. I I couldn't resist. Well, the locals didn't like that, so they asked Jesus to leave their region because this was their income source. So in a couple days, Jesus has done a lot of miracles, but he's also calmed an impossible storm. He's freed a man from an impossible life of demonic control. And now he's back to the place that it all started. Some might say the most impossible feat he would ever uh, accomplish until his own resurrection would be this one. He shows us the power over death. And by the way, that's the hope that we want to share with you today. That the reason we're here today is because we want you to know, without a doubt, Jesus has that kind of power, the power over death. Let's read on, verse 22. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter's dying, please come put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. 
So Jesus went with him. And then we're going to jump to verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any longer? Hearing what they said, Jesus told him, told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. Now look, every culture, including ours, have their own funeral traditions. One of their traditions, Jewish families in the first century, would be when someone dies, they call in, like this is the basic funeral package, okay? They, they called in a singer, a flutist, and professional mourners. That's just what they did. Even the poorest families would do this. Now, in this case, there would have been many mourners because in this case, the individual, uh, this was a child, number one, so that's tragic, but this individual is a leader in the synagogue, which meant he was the main leader of the community, one of them at least. And so it's frenzied, it's crazy. And Jesus arrives and he says, she's asleep. I said, really? Asleep, Jesus? Like I'm, I've walked into these settings where just tragedy abounds, you know, and I can tell you, I might try to say something. I can tell you what I would never say. I think maybe they're just asleep. Because here's the thing, only one has the power to say something like that. The one who has the power to raise the dead. That's why. Now anyway, verse 40, he said that she's sleeping. Verse 40, but they laughed at him. Now, I've had the honor to work with many, many funeral directors over my time as a minister. I have found that for the most part, they're they're called individuals. Like, you don't go into that industry and last unless you are called to help people. And so they're compassionate people. They're professionals, sure. The very best of them see it as a ministry themselves. I can tell you, these grievers, they don't have that heart because they can turn from wailing to laughing at Jesus. That's not right. So he promptly puts them all out takes the father and the three disciples with him into the room. I don't really know who was there and how that lays out, but I imagine the mother was there. And so can you imagine they walk into the room, it's thick with emotion and grief. And, and so you're brought by Jesus. Can you think about Peter, James, and John for a minute? Like, I don't think they probably knew this guy until, the, until now. I don't think they probably knew this family. Maybe they did, I don't know, but... Can you imagine being them walking into that setting and being so far out of the circle and yet there to witness the grief of this family? How awkward that would be when the mother stands up and buries her face into the chest of her husband and says, it's too late. Our baby's gone. Verse 41, he took her, Jesus took the little girl by the hand, said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, don't miss that, the girl stood up, began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, obviously, they were completely astonished. And then Jesus gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Now, look, I, I've read this story maybe a hundred times, I don't know, and preached from it, I'm sure, numerous times. And it always surprises me when Jesus doesn't want this to be known right away. Like, this could have been a moment where his already over-the-top repu reputation would have just soared into the outer stratosphere because you walk out of that house with a girl who's now alive that was dead, I mean, think about what that would do for his cause, you know, when he's leading people forward to understand who God is in their life. I mean, his plan, here's the thing. There's a lot of speculation why he didn't do that. One reason, and it's probably the most logical reason, 
is because he wasn't ready yet to fully reveal himself to the world because it would maybe curtail what he wanted to do in just 10 months when he would go to the cross himself. And so the fact is that, that maybe it wasn't the time for this to be made known that he had that kind of power for most people. Some people would have got it, of course. But I wonder if there's another reason here, one that I'm just speculating and you can take it or leave it, but this is a 12-year-old girl. A girl who likely got a glimpse of eternity. She died and found out there's another side to death. And, and we know very little about what happens when a person dies and goes beyond. And I guess we have stories of people coming back and talking about it. But whoever has had that kind of death coming back to life experience, almost everyone says the same thing. They won't come back. I mean, it's, the suffering's left behind. You might know a person in your life who now they're maybe aged and, and they're, they're lingering in life, and they're maybe even in a rest home or a place like that where they're just on hospice, and they're asking the question, God, just take me. Why, why have you let me stay here? I'll, I'm ready to go. For her parents, this is a big win. Our baby is back. On this side of death, we naturally cling to life. We are created to, be, to live. We, we don't give up life. But for a child in death who then leaves there to come back here, I don't know. Like, like, I wonder. I wonder about how her life might unfold after that. And Jesus understood this. So maybe the word, and it would eventually, the word gets out that she was indeed dead and she was brought back to life. She's the middle school girl going to the lunchroom and all the other girls are saying, I don't want to sit by the dead girl. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a stigma that it might be put on this girl. Like, think about the fathers coming together to arrange a marriage. That's how they did it back then, 12-year-old girls. They, they would, the fathers would say, here, you, you got three goats and a couple sheep, and yeah, you can, you, can, uh, you can marry my daughter. Something like that. So anyway, they're in the room together, and, and the dads are trying to work out a deal, and, and, and so the, 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 the perspective group's dad says, uh, isn't your daughter the one that was dead? Is she going to be around very long? Because I need grandkids, you know? I mean, like there's things that come with the stigma of death and relife. And so Jesus, why did he have this hushed? I don't know. He could have put this little girl on his shoulder and he could have walked out in front of those sick grievers and said, look at this. Those of you who laughed at me, look at this girl. She is alive. What are you going to do about that? Are you going to laugh about that? He didn't do that. Why is that? Maybe it's because of her, as much as because of his reputation. Maybe he knew that, that he was asking a lot of her to come back. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Now, no matter what, I know this seems impossible. I know that for most people, probably for many people here today, it seems laughable that a person could die and be raised to life. I get it. But in several chapters, we're going to see another death, aren't we? We're going to see Jesus himself go to a cross by his own choice and die on that cross and be buried in a tomb completely, fully dead. And on the third day, a day we celebrate on a day like today, be raised to life. Praise be to God through Jesus Christ. Here is Easter. God came to earth to raise us, to restore us, to give us life better than we could ever possibly imagine having life without him. It's a life that begins for, it can begin for you today and that it can be carried out for all eternity. That's what resurrection is. Now permit me to make just some very obvious points pertinent to Easter today and I think every day. Here's the first one. There is a huge difference between reaching out to Jesus and putting your trust in Jesus. I mean, it's one thing for Jairus to run to the feet of Jesus and throw himself in the dirt and say, my daughter is sick, can you please help me? Because he's seen or at least experienced that Jesus has helped many people. It's a whole other thing for him to believe and trust Jesus even after he found out she was dead because he hasn't done this yet. 
I mean, it takes a ton of faith and hope for it to happen for Jairus. And there's a huge difference between doing church stuff and gathering with people on a, on a holiday that commemorates something big and actually thrusting yourself to the feet of the one who says he can raise you from the dead. A huge difference. And, and, and by the way, I don't think he called us here today to have some experience. I think that we're here so that we can experience resurrection, the promise of God, and the promise that is due to us if we'll choose it. Because here's another thing, there's a huge difference between letting Jesus be a part of your life and trusting Jesus with the most scary parts of your life. Jesus didn't die on a cross just to be a part of my life. It's wrong to think that you can just add Jesus to your life like, like he's like an addendum to whatever's going on in your life, to be honest. I remember when as a child, uh, I attended a vacation Bible school. Anybody remember what those are, vacation Bible? I, rem- I, I, I attended one in my little town, Woodbine, Iowa, and, and there was this little church. I think it was an Assembly God church. I'm not sure. But anyway, they did a really nice VBS for little kids like me. And so it, they always did it in the hottest time of the summer, I think. It was so hot, I remember this time. So I'm sitting there in this very hot sanctuary. And the teacher, I don't know, maybe the preacher, I don't remember who it was, they said something like, children, we're all sinners. If we die sinners, we're going to hell, and it's very hot. And I'm thinking, hotter than here? <laughs> and, and so, you know, I'm fired up, you no know, pun intended, you know. And, they, you know, they continued probably with, you know, some fire and brimstone type stuff. And then, but and then the message came, Jesus died to save you from going to a hot eternal hell. Anybody want to go? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get me out of here. It's hot here. Good, say a prayer, you'll be safe, blah, 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 go on with your life. I don't think it was quite like that, but I do think that people maybe tend to have that kind of commitment to God. Like, oh, I don't want to go to the hot place. Uh, what do I got to do? You know, it's like, what's the, what's the least thing? <laughs> you know, give me, give me the, the margin, right? Where's the margin for me? Now, I'm sorry for the messaging that any church has given on this that makes it seem cheap and limited. And if it's our church, I'm especially sorry for that or coming from me. But I have learned about Jesus some things in the last six chapters of Mark even now that shows me there's a side of God that refuses to just be added to our life like a footnote on the bottom of the page. Like I I said a prayer, I just got wet, whatever it is we do with that. There is a God who sent his son, Jesus, his one and only son, the scripture describes him as Jesus to a cross who was obliterated, literally physically, spiritually, psychologically obliterated on a cross so that you, so that I don't have to go there. Okay? God chose my son will pay that for you. It cost him dearly, deeply, and it's not cheap. So I don't want to make it cheap on my end. This is way too big of a sacrifice to be satisfied with a little of you. To Jairus, I mean, Jesus said, do you want me to raise her? Just don't be afraid. Trust me. And it's almost the indication is, are you going to keep coming with me? Because I'm going there to raise her. Are you in or not? See, Jesus is Lord, and he never embraced a title of consultant or advisor. Lord, that is a title of absolute sovereignty and leadership in my life, your life. This synagogue leader, by the way, would have risked everything in his life to throw himself at the feet of this Jesus because the pressure was already on from people like him in his religion to reject Jesus, and even they're even talking now about killing him, okay? His status as a priest in the opposing religious party was at stake here. His role as a local leader in that community in the synagogue, one of the most important roles of leadership in a community, his reputation with his colleagues 
We don't get the story after the fact, but I always have a theory about people who are named in these stories. Jairus. I think whenever the Bible records a name, that means that person was still around well after the resurrection telling the story. I think Jairus, his whole life changed. And he was one who was talked about by, and probably talked about his experiences for years and years to come. Because there is no Easter without trust. And friend, without surrender from you, there can be no resurrection for you. Now, the crowd is everywhere as this story is unfolding. I mean, when Jairus comes to Jesus and begs for his help, there's a huge crowd there. There was a crowd of mourners in, inside and outside the house when they got back to his home. But ultimately, Easter is never about the crowd. It's always about you at the foot of Jesus. That's, that's what Easter is. It's just this point where you have to decide about surrender. It's a constant in the Bible. When people surrender everything, they, they, in return, they get the best things. This is the Easter story. To kneel before the one who gave everything so that in turn you can gain resurrection. And the only way we, we get there with him is, is our own surrender. That's what I'm talking about, by, about cost. Not that you paid the price. He did. But the, in this Jesus light world, I just got to say, just like this teacher that tried to tell me back in 1968 or whatever it was, look, we're not all children of God, kids. We're only children of God when, when we relinquish our lives to the one who gave his life for us. And he refuses to share you with anyone or anything because he's your Lord. Here's a man who fell at his needs and said, I am wrecked. God, help me. My daughter, she's in jeopardy. Help me. And, and then when he found out she was dead, Jesus said this, don't be afraid. Just believe. I don't know where you are today. I don't know if it's just about the ham or just about your three-year-old or I, I don't know if it's just that, you know, that, that you, know, you got some friends that you brought to you. I don't know. All I know is this, that there's a point in this moment where he wants you to know he's real. He raises the dead, and that promise can be yours. So, Jesus, you, you split time between your birth and your death, B.C. and A.D. And now, 2,000 some odd years later, Easter brings us to the brink of the same decision that Jairus had to make back then from Jesus, maybe you're something, to Jesus, I'm trusting you're everything. And so I surrender. I trust you for the resurrection of life. And ultimately, I trust you for life eternal. And Lord, if I've ever made this a holiday, I repent of it. If I've ever cheapened this experience, I confess that. Because there's something far deeper about today than, than just another way to gather with family, another way to dress up, another way to come before you and experience something exciting. This is resurrection. This is life. We thank you that we can be here to experience the message that comes from you from 2,000 years ago about truth, about hope, about resurrection. Yeah, I want you to think about what happened when uh, he had told the little girl to get up, and immediately she got up, she started walking around. And then the next thing he said was, well, he said, don't tell anyone. Time's not right yet. But then he said, give her something to eat, which is curious to me. Probably just said something about how long she'd been laying there. I don't know. But I wonder what kind of celebration that was, like in this household when it's time to throw some food on the table and how different that food seemed than how it ever looked before. You know what I mean? Like that meal had to be the most memorable meal that family ever had. And Jesus gave us, his people, his church, his body, a meal like that that should be the most memorable meal we share. We call it the Lord's Supper. Some say the communion. 
but it's a meal where we celebrate together with Christians around the world, by the way, remembering the sacrifice of the Son of God and his resurrection from death, sealing our own. And in these emblems that we have, you might have gotten these when you came in the door, there's a piece of bread which represents his body broken for you. And let's take this bread as he invited us together, where we remember that his body was broken on a cross so that you and I, we don't have to suffer the death of our sins. He took them to the cross for us, his body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. And then, if you remember, at that same table when he unveiled this before the church, he said, I'm going to send this cup around. This cup is emblematic of the new covenant in my blood, a promise that is not only for those, of you, those who are at that table in the, on the night before his crucifixion, but a promise that is thrust forward right to this moment in this church and around the world when Christians take this as a promise and a hope for a new covenant that has come through his death, burial, and resurrection for all believers. Take and drink it. Because he said this, do this until I return, and then we'll do it together. There, there's that experience in this, in this, this story that unfolds where Jairus and Jesus are headed back to his home. Jairus has hope that Jesus is going to help and, and heal his daughter. And then remember what happens. The, the servants from the home came, come to them, and they talk to Jairus. And they say, there's no need to bother the teacher anymore. She's dead. Don't bother. And, and all week I've been thinking about that, like how there are likely many people who are here today and you're, you're long past the point where you think you should bother Jesus when anything else because it's too late for you. And I think that's probably what Jairus thought when they said, don't bother. He said, oh, it's too late. Jesus, don't bother. And in this story, it tells us a lot of things. There's a lot of beautiful symbolism in this story, but there's something that's not symbolic at all in this story. It's true. It's never too late. Not with God. I mean, it's too late with us oftentimes. We give up long before God will on each other, on ourselves. And if you're one of those people who you're here today saying, well, you know, this is all really, and this is a great story for all these churchy people here, but it's too late for me. You have no idea who I am and what I've done. I'm just telling you, it is not too late. And you know how I can say that with great confidence? With, with a confidence of promise. Do you know why? Because Jesus raises the dead. And if you're still living, it's not too late for you. And even after you die, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever comes after me will live. That's a promise he'll keep. And if you're a person who today you're coming to life, you're saying, you know what? I don't think it is too late because of Jesus. And we can help you with that. We have locations called The Hub on each of our ex exits. Stop there and say, you know what? The preacher said it's not too late for me. What do I need to do next? Where, where do I go with this? And, and the people there will be happy to help you. And so will we.